In a recent look at who controls statewide executive offices across the country, Sabato's crystal ball found that one party is in control in 36 states. Managing editor for Sabato's Crystal Ball, Kyle Kondik, says that we could have even more one-party statewide executives after the 2022 elections, which would fit in with a larger trend toward one-party dominance. He joins us now to discuss. Welcome. Thanks for having me. Can you break this down a little bit? What, what happened? You know, how do we have 36 states with one-party dominance? Yeah, I mean, look, I mean, I think it's a, it's a growing trend in, in American life, which is that people just aren't splitting their tickets as much as they used to. Uh, in fact, I, you know, I, I, won, I talked to a candidate a couple of years ago who was uh, thinking of, you know, he was a, a county level person and was thinking about running for statewide office. And he basically said, hey, I might as well run for governor because if I run for one of these down ballot offices, uh, I'm going to be tied at the hip to whoever's running for governor anyway. So I might as well just go for it myself. You know, it used to be that it, w it was a lot more common for, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, statewide executive officials to be of different parties. But we're seeing, you know, over time here that, uh, you know, in red states, you know, Democrats are finding it harder and harder to win. And in blue states, Republicans are finding it harder and harder to win. And the trend may be in 2022 when a lot of these offices are up uh, that we may see even 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 fewer states that have kind of split government in this kind of way. What are, what are the consequences of this functionally in these one party states? Which faction of the of the party that's in power is more is more dominant generally the kind of the the the, the wing or the center of the party hmm. uh you know look i think that i think that it might kind of look in some ways like like governors the governor does like for instance in a state like ohio where the republicans hold all the statewide executive offices obviously sherrod brown a democrat is still in the u.s senate but we're not considering that as part of this uh analysis but um, you know, I consider all of, you know, the governor of Ohio is Mike DeWine. Uh, I, I think all of the Republican statewide executive officials are kind of out of that sort of establishment mold. I wouldn't say any of them are kind of um, out and out kind of newcomers to politics and also are out and out Trump people. But it may be that, you know, in, in over the course of 2022, maybe we'll, we'll start to see some more of those kind of Trump folks uh, emerge. But, you know, so, so just just to use that as an example, sort of uh, I'd say they're kind of more more establishment types. Uh, and, and, and they kind of maybe mirror, mirror who, the, you know, who the governor is. So is this largely a function of polarization? That's probably the obvious question that you deal with a lot on that issue. But if, if, it's, if it is, or even if it isn't, what are some of the other trends that could be culprits here as well? Uh, yeah, I think it's largely largely polarization. I also think that you know the parties have gotten more ideologically straightened out over time. You know, it used to be that you know a couple couple decades ago you might still have some you know liberal to moderate Republicans in the Northeast, and they, they still do exist uh, to, to some to some degree, just not to the degree to which they used to. Uh, you'd have a kind of moderate to conservative Democrats in, in the South, and sometimes some of these statewide executive offices would be sort of the last readout of these uh, you know kind of dying off factions of these these parties. Uh, and just over time, uh, the voters, I think, have decided that they don't really split their tickets as much. Uh, and also the, the, the parties aren't necessarily offering the kind of ideologically mixed choices that they used to in the past. And actually, sometimes when they do, it can it can pay off. You know, you do have um, so a, a handful of uh, state governors who uh, don't really match the party partisanship of their states. You know, Larry Hogan in Maryland or Charlie Baker uh, in, in Massachusetts. Uh, or John Bell Edwards, for that for that matter, in Louisiana, the kind of moderate uh, Democrat down there, at least socially conservative Democrat. Um, so they still exist; they just don't exist to the level at which they used to. John Bell Edwards is the only example I can think of of a, of a Democrat, uh, you know, that won a gubernatorial election in in a Republican state. But it, as you said, it's really easy to think of uh, to think of Republicans who were elected by deep blue states. What, what is what is going on? Is, is, is there just a different kind of politics or personality type among Democrats that makes them so uh, willing to elect uh, Democratic governors that doesn't exist on on the Republican side? Or is it just all about taxes? You know, you, you do have uh, th there are a couple Democratic governors in kind of darker red states, Laura Kelly in Kansas, although part of the reason that she won is that uh, Chris Kobach was a Republican nominee in 2018 and he was just a really bad candidate and, and basically kind of almost too right wing even for a state like Kansas. Uh, Andy Bashir in Kentucky is, is, is another one. But mm -hmm. I do think you, you make a good point that. There are a number of dark blue states that have Republican governors. I think I think sometimes that they could pitch themselves as being kind of a check on a liberal uh, state legislature. I do, you know. Also, the you know the Democratic coalition, you know, they're they're just more people who 
uh, identify as moderates who are in the, the Democratic coalition as opposed to moderates who are in the Republican coalition. And so maybe that just this point in time, maybe there's a little bit more willingness to uh, to split tickets on the Democratic side as opposed to the Republican side. You know, we do even see this in, in the in the House. There, there are a very few number of members who um, represent districts that the other party won for president. But there are more uh, uh, there are there's slightly more Republicans in Clinton in, in Biden one seats than there are Democrats in, in Trump won seats. And, um, you know, and also we've seen in recent years, it used to be in the 60s, 70s and 80s, you know, the Republicans were thought of as more of the presidential party and they sort of struggled a little bit in Congress. Uh, now, you know, Democrats often will do a little bit better in presidential races than they, they do down ballot. And maybe it's a function of there's some of these voters who, uh, uh, you know, maybe maybe don't want to be voting uh, uh, complete tickets for Democrats. That's a really important thing to keep an eye on. Kyle, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Really appreciate it. We will be back with more Rising right after this.